Hello. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Kelly. Thank you for attending the Risk Mitigation through RFID webinar. We are going to go ahead and begin. Um, in this webinar, we're going to talk about reducing shortages, improving safety, and ensuring compliance in the oil and gas environment. Let's go to the next slide. Today's discussion, we're going to start off with Dr. Ben Zogi. He is an engineering professor at the Texas A&M University. He's also the director of the RFID Oil and Gas Consortium. He works with several end users through that consortium. In fact, he just got back from the Middle East this week on an RFID project concerning directly on personal safety and compliance in the oil and gas industry. So he's got a lot to talk about there. Then we have Solon Paul. He is the CEO of the Field ID. And he has been working in the engineering and also in the business solving case of, of RFID, and especially in inspections and compliance. Zach Barron has five years of RFID experience at Holland 1916, solving a lot of custom RFID projects. Next. Um, in this webinar, I uh, encourage you to go ahead and ask questions at the webinar, but we'll be handling them at the end. And I will read out the question and assign it to certain users unless you ask me to select the panelists. Um, and if you have any questions, just raise your hand. And um, you know, if you're having trouble hearing, um, we'll try to help. So with that, um, the flow of the presentation, once again, is a little bit of an introduction to each of the companies. We're going to start with Dr. Zogi talking about why the oil and gas industry needs RFID. And then Mr. Sumal, uh, Sumin Modal will handle some specific case studies within customers that will tell you more about how they solve those problems. And then Zach Barron is going to cover um, specifically on the RFID tags and how to extend those tags to that harsh oil and gas environment. And then we're going to answer this in 30 minutes and have uh, time for question and answer. Hey, Kelly, thanks a lot. This is Ben Zogi. Uh, uh, something I'd like to share with you had to do with the personnel and asset safety and security. Uh, in the past four years that we have created the consortium, the momentum for the RFID has been up and down. And in the past year and a half, it has been down. But we see in the next six to 12 months, there is a high level of interest and demand for actual implementation of RFID system. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the information is on the web. If you go to rfid.tamu.edu, uh, there is information about the consortium. Uh, the focus has changed. Uh, we don't have any vendor in the leadership any longer. Uh, it's been run by the university. Uh, we've been conducting quite a few RFID feasibility uh, study. Uh, from an unbiased perspective, vendor and neutral. Uh, the, we got facility at the university to actually uh, implement different use cases uh, that has been uh, uh, not mandated, that has been actually shared with us with industry. Uh, we also have funded projects. Uh, and we try to document some of the best practices uh, working with the end user and also the vendor. Next slide, please. These are some of the challenges the industry is facing. And uh, primarily, the focus on, on the production plan safety. Uh, their interest is they have a, a lot of workforce uh, throughout the produ production plant, uh, where it would be very, very helpful to know the location of the personnel uh, due to the exposure to uh, hazardous gases, primarily H2S. Uh, they want to make sure they can optimize the time for evacuation, uh, make sure we have a real-time count, head count, 
of the personnel at the mustering station, uh, taking the human factor out. Uh, counting uh, the mission critical tools, specifically the tools that goes with the employee. And the important thing is they want to make sure the equipment is close to the employee, whether it's a harness, whether it's an oxygen tank. Uh, there has been cases the employee will take a mouth because of the weight uh, using a potential technology to provide an alarm to the control office will be extremely helpful. On uh, the preventive maintenance, high level of interest in flange management, uh, minimizing and being more proactive with any pipeline leaks. On the asset integrity, the certification of the equipment, making sure the equipment are in best shape before the usage. Uh, we see high level of problem with the shrinkage. Primarily in the past couple of years, uh, the problem has been more focused on copper and uh, a small theft uh, actually results in a major damage to the equipment that has a direct impact on the production of the facility. Uh, the other thing we noticed that uh, due to the size of the facility, there is a distance of kilometers between wellhead manifolds and the production site. Assets are being used at different sites without any coordination, and having a visibility is definitely, you know, uh, is a must. Uh, the compliance and audit. At the present time, everything is paper and pencil. There is a high level of interest, you know, in automating the processes. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a facility that we just uh, did a study in Middle East. Uh, high level of exposure to H2S. It's a sour project. And the interest for uh, the potential customer is real-time tracking of personnel and assets on production and off plot uh, in the vicinity. Next slide, please. Now, the recent leaks and other industrial incidents have raised sentiments and a high level of urgency about health, safety, security, and environment topics. And uh, the safety incident at a site not only actually incurs personnel and he heavy financial loss, but it also has adverse impact on the operating company's image and brand in the society. And that one is extremely hard to put an actual number uh, right next to it. Next page. This is a list of uh, actually challenges that the RFID RTLS, whether it's a passive, active, Wi-Fi, ultra wideband, and GPS, uh, can provide a solution. Uh, from uh, knowing exactly where the location of a person, either because of a health or an incident has fallen down, to providing better guidance to the rescue team to make sure they respond to a real incident rather than uh, it is just a fall, uh, to make sure they are not going to be in a danger position. Uh, head count is a definite must. How can we automate it, the whole process? It's being used for onshore and actually offshore application. Uh, the real-time tracking, uh, the tracking is more on site at a production uh, facility and anything off plot, uh, their interest is when they arrive at the facility, they want to make sure uh, the proper person is going to be there. Uh, the important thing about author authorized versus unauthorized uh, employee, whether they have the permit to work, whether they have the certification, you know, to be at the right zone at the right time. Uh, the technology uh, that we have shared with them can also provide them an opportunity to go ahead and replay the past events for post-analysis uh, to streamline their processes. And that, that will help them with some of the non-compliance violation. Uh, all of those, uh, from an RFID perspective, uh, will improve the safety and the evacuation and has a direct impact on the processes and productivity. And this is a real case that actually we've been working, as Kelly said, I just got back from Middle East and we'll be sharing more in the near future. Next slide, please. 
Coleman. Thank you very much, Dr. Zogi. Hi, everyone. My name is Soman Mondell, and I'm the CEO of Field ID. And I'm actually involved in one of the sections that Dr. Zogi mentioned, so specifically safety compliance, equipment status, equipment compliance. So at Field ID, we focus on a specific area, and we combine three major technologies, mobile computers, uh, mobile phones, as well as cloud computing, as well as RFID. So I'm going to kind of go through two cases of where this is relevant. Can we go to the next slide? Just to give you a little background about who we are, you know, we are actually not an RFID company. We are a software company, and we use RFID as a tool. So just as uh, you know, inventory software would use barcodes as a tool or RFID, RFID is one of the, uh, the most uh, advanced or one of the most important tools that we have in our arsenal to help customers maintain compliance. We have over 250 deployments, and, and because safety is everywhere, you know, not just oil and gas, it's also in mining, it's in entertainment, our customer base includes companies like Cirque du Soleil that use RFID to manage, believe it or not, their stages and their, their equipment that their employee uses as well as companies in the oil and gas industry and the mining, mining industry, as well as many others. Currently, there are over 13,000 organizations that access field ID for their safety information. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through two case studies. So think of them as case studies. One is going to look at the use of RFID from the point of a service provider, so someone in the oil and gas industry who's providing a service to an end user. And then the second case study that I'm going to look at is a, an end user, someone that uses RFID to improve their, their internal efficiencies. Can we go to the next slide? And let's just go to the next slide. Great. So let's go through the first ex uh, previous slide. So let's go through the first example uh, of a service provider. So we have a customer called Pause Energy Service. They are a classic Gulf Coast service provider that provides uh, rental equipment. So they have a, you know, obviously there's so many different types of rental companies in, in oil and gas, but they specifically provide lifting and rigging equipment, specifically pipe slings. So these are equipment that they, they, they literally bring in a truck to an end user, they rent them out, and they have to bring it back to their facility. So let's walk through really the complicated workflow as, as something as, as might be simple as a sling, but there's a lot of work that has to go in, into this, this rental process. So pretend you're Pause Energy Service you know, two years ago. So how would you do this? Okay, you get a big order for you know, renting out of, let's say, 10 pipe slings. So what they used to do is take those 10 pipe slings, they would have to write down the serial number on a, uh, on a spreadsheet or a clipboard. So that's where the, the first problem comes, human identification, human error in looking at that serial number. I mean, an R to someone could be a 5 to someone else. So there's, there's problem number one. They didn't have to load those you know, pieces of equipment out. They'd have to take it to their end user. They'd have to give it to the end user. Then two weeks later, They'd have to come back on site to their end user. They'd have to collect those pieces of equipment again. So there's where problem number two is. You know, they're going to read those serial numbers again. There might be, uh, they might read them wrong. So there's a whole uh, level of ambiguity about, you know, are we getting the right pieces of equipment back? You know, a pipe sling looks like a pipe sling looks like a pipe sling. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with that. Secondly, you'll have to inspect each piece of equipment before it's put back into service or rented out again. So they would have to write the serial number down, they'd have to do the inspection, and they'd have to store all that information in a, uh, you know, in a, in, in a, in a, literally in a filing cabinet. As Dr. Zogi mentioned, a lot of times equipment, compliance records are completely paper and pen driven. Now, Let's fast forward to, uh, you know, let's say six months ago when they're using a, uh, a solution that combines RFID and a cloud-based solution. So now 
what they do is if you look at the RFID tags on the right hand side and you see how it's attached, what Pause Energy Service now does, they use a rugged mobile device. They take that device and they scan 10 pieces of equipment and they immediately check it out. So in this case, they aren't using a portal um, apparatus, they're using handheld devices. They load those 10 up, immediately that saves them a bunch of time. So they take a process of literally having to look at a serial number and copy it down to scan, 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 ship away. That's you know, saving time right there. They go, they send it to their end user. When it comes back, they can scan all 10 of them again, and then they can perform an inspection on the handheld device. So they can scan the piece of equipment, then the software allows them to do an inspection and check it back in to, uh, you know, into their facility. So they've taken a completely human error prone process and they've automated it using RFID and mobile devices. Now it, it doesn't stop there. Because they have all that information available, cloud-based solutions can use that, or you know, normal software solutions can use that data of where things are and provide a high level service to their customers. So imagine you're the end user of Pause Energy Services. You can now log in to a, a website where you can see where all the equipment is. You can see all of the inspections that were done on the equipment that you're renting. You can see what needs to come back to the facility, when it needs to come back. That whole process was extremely time intensive before, but is now completely automated. So what's the result? So it's a huge reduction in, in human error. It's a reduction in inspection time, so it, recording information in the field. Can we, look, can we go back to the last slide, previous slide? Just give it a second. I think we're having some problem here. So it's going to reduce time. And so from a lot of our, from a lot of the case studies that we've done, we've seen literally about a 70% reduction in inspection time. So that's time out in the field that, that people are doing inspections. And there's also from an end, from a, like a service provider standpoint, you're now providing your end users with a higher level of service. So before where you would do everything with paper and pen, you wouldn't be able to do any reporting or providing that information. Now because you're using RFID and you're using an electronic system to manage that process, you can now provide your customers with uh, an added level of customer service. I'm now going to go to the next um, case study that I have, so the next slide which is uh, oceaneering. So they're a, uh, a great case study for us because they're a, a larger oil and gas company and have a, a, a big presence in, uh, in the Gulf Coast. And they use, a, uh, they use RFID for a, for a specific, specific case. Now, you know, I can go through some of their, their rigging in inspections and uh, you know, their harness inspections, but I'm going to actually talk about something that's not listed here. A really interesting case. So if we go back, let's say, three years ago, Oceaneering has these remotely operated vehicles that actually go, uh, obviously, underwater, where they have multiple units inside a, you know, it's obviously a big piece of equipment, so there's multiple areas that need to be inspected uh, in, in an ROV. And these, obviously, these, these devices, these pieces of equipment, um, these vehicles are, are put under a lot of stress. They go under underwater. They go to great depths, and um, you know there's a lot of compliance and there's a lot of inspections that need to be done on such expensive equipment. So what would they do before? They would literally have a big vehicle. They would serialize or not even serialize. You know different areas of the vehicle. They would inspect the vehicle with paper and pen. And you know they would they would try to manage that completely using paper, but now what they do is they they RFID tag using high frequency chips. They actually uh, RFID tag certain parts of the vehicle. The vehicles are, are they go underwater in you know obviously a very rugged environment, an environment that's completely submerged in water. When the vehicles come back. They just take handheld readers and they can scan each part of the of the vehicle and they can they can do an inspection, they can do their checks, it'll walk them through the whole process. So again, the same thing is happening. We're taking a completely manually, visually identifying something to literally tapping something and then doing an inspection, 
doing a compliance check, recording data. What's the end result for a company, like an end user? So I'm using a very kind of abstract example of a remotely operated vehicle, but this can also be done on, you know, for example, a, a fall, uh, a harness, a full body harness. It can be used in lifting and rigging. Wherever there has to be an inspection, a compliance procedure conducted, or a safety audit trail or an audit trail, RFID really helps eliminate those problems. So from an end user's perspective, what are they doing? They are documenting all the safety certifications, all the safety audit trail that they require to maintain compliance. So if there ever was an accident or an injury investigation, or just their need to increase safety, you are accomplishing this by using RFID. If we go to the next slide, I want to talk about some of the, the trends uh, that we see in RFID, and so you know, obviously we're a. Can we go to the next? Yeah, if we're if if you know, we're a software company, we really focus on um, some of the some of the newer technologies that are out there. So there's three there's three trends that we really see coming in: near field communication, mobile devices, and cloud computing. So um, from our experience, some of the big barriers to entries before were you know mobile devices. You have to buy a big rugged device to be able to read an RFID tag that has an RFID reader built in. Now with the new phones, they now come with what's called near field communication. Now that's a uh, type of RFID, it's high frequency RFID and, um, and you know, quite interesting, a lot of new harnesses that are being built come built with RF high frequency RFID tags built into them. So what does this mean? Your new mobile devices like the Galaxy Nexus, the new Android devices, the new Windows Phone devices, the Nokia devices, they come built with an RFID reader in it. So no longer will you need, and a lot of our customers are seeing this, no longer will you need to buy a big rugged device, attach an RFID reader to it. You can use your, your, your phone, like I use a phone that has a built-in RFID reader. Uh, the, the BlackBerry Bolt even has an RFID reader built into it. So imagine you really are lowering the barrier to entry to getting into a solution like this. Another trend that we see is is cloud computing. You know, big software deployments often require a lot of time uh, and and money to get off the ground. We now see pilot projects with RFID using cloud-based solutions. What does cloud means? It means you don't have to hire additional IT staff or additional servers. Literally, if you want to start using uh, a specific RFID solution, you can you know, buy the hardware obviously, but you can turn the software portion of it on immediately without having to go through that whole, um, you know, the huge investment up front. So from a software standpoint, we really see near field communication, which is what you see people using to pay for things with their visa, for example, uh, when you're scanning things at the store with your, with your phone, that's, that's near field communication. Mobile devices, there's no question. I mean, uh, uh, you know, actually right half an hour ago, they just released the iPhone 5 if people are interested in that. Um, and, and cloud computing, we, we all hear about the buzz around cloud computing, but it's really these three technologies converging together that, that makes me really excited and that what we see a lot of our um, you know, consumers and a lot of our customers getting excited about. Go to the next slide. Zach, I think it's on to you. All right, thanks, Shoman. Good afternoon, everyone. So Holland has been in production identification business for a long time, since 1916, as the name indicates. So we've got a lot of experience, especially in the verticals that require more rugged products. It was about five years ago when we were really introduced to RFID and started working to become a leader in industrial RFID tagging. Um, as is detailed on the slide, Holland manufactures a wide array of products. Um, this gives the RFID division access to a lot of manufacturing equipment. So we're basically a mass manufacturing job shop, which is, which is big when you're making all the different shapes and sizes of RFID tags that our, our projects require. And this is what allows us to address projects with the Holland discovery, design, manufacture, and test methodology, and we'll go into that in a minute. But the bottom line um, is in order for an RFID system to work in the oil and gas industry, the tags have to be extremely dependable. And so that means extra rugged tags for assets that require a lot more than your off-the-shelf flat RFID tag with, with rear adhesive. So let's go to the next slide. 
RFID tagging challenges, so common challenges that tend to be thrown at us from the oil and gas industry. Impact and abrasion, this almost always is a factor. And it, it's, it's funny, the first thing that uh, our clients do when we send them tags is they literally hit them with a sledgehammer. Um, and the first couple times that happened, I thought it was uh, coincidental, uh, but uh, the trends continued. And sure enough, they do that because the assets that RFID tags are going on in the field are, are ridiculously abused, whether it be from head-on impact or from sheer abrasion. Uh, the tag has to be made of the same stuff the asset is or it just won't survive. Permanent attachment. Obviously, an RFID tag isn't doing anybody any good if it's lying on the ground, nowhere near the asset is it was attached to. So permanent attachment is very, a very big deal. Um, frack iron, pipe slings, shackles, plug valves, the list goes on and on, and all these products have a couple things in common. They're, they're oddly shaped, and, and they get abused like most people would not believe. Um, so permanent attachment, that's a, a, a very important point. Ranging sizes and odd shapes of assets, and this ties in with permanent attachment. One size does not even come close to fitting all in the oil and gas industry. You've got different radiuses, small areas to put tags, different requirements for different assets. Multiple styles of tags are needed for a company's fleet of assets. Um, durable human readable information on the RFID tag. Uh, there are a few reasons a company might want human readable graphics on the tags. Of course, branding is a common one, but critical user data is another important one, and the data tends to be variable, so that's something to keep in mind as an option. Different assets have different max loads, pressures, etc., and that kind of high liability data is important. And if you want the data to last in the field, it's going to need to be etched or stamped on the tag. Screen printing isn't going to cut it. And then we've got a, a few other common challenges up here. We uh, won't take the time to go through each of these here, but, but that kind of covers the things that come up on a regular basis in this industry. Let's go to the next slide. Custom design methodology, discovery, design, manufacture, and test. And so this is the process that we go through with almost all projects we look at, and we, we think it's the best way to do it. Um, the first step is the discovery process. And here you are not only defining the tag requirement, but you're uncovering all potential issues that, that may not be evident. So first I suggest going through all the tag challenges we just talked about, which of those challenges are present in your application, identify them so they can be dealt with in the design phase, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, read range. Clearly this is something that needs to be known early on in the tag selection process because it comes or it makes a lot of decisions for us. So if all you need is a close contact read, then, then maybe HF tags will work, NFC, like what someone was talking about. But in a lot of cases in oil and gas applications, people are going UHF. And in most cases, people think they need a whole lot more read range than they actually need. So uh, that's got to be discussed. I'll, I'll ask the read range question, and uh, someone might say, we need as much as possible. Can you give me 30 feet of read range? But uh, there is definitely such a thing as too much read range for an application. For example, if your ap application is for recertification, recertification of lifting slings. Well, you only want to identify one sling at a time because you're recording inspections for each sling. And when these inspections are done, there are typically tens if not hundreds of slings in a somewhat confined area. And so you don't want a 30-foot read range in a tag because you'll, you'll read all the slings at once and you won't be able to single out a single sling so you can work with it. There are a lot of applications similar to this in oil and gas. So the read range question is one uh, that needs to be given a lot of thought. Now, there's obviously applications that do require more read range as well, but uh, it just needs to be analyzed. Is data written to the tag? This one, this is one that needs to be figured out early on as well. In, in almost all cases, the data resides in the software system, and nothing is being written to the tag. For instance, with field ID, in those situations, the tag is an identifier, and the information resides in the software system. But in those cases where data must be written to the tag, the memory capacity of the tag is very important. How many characters of data need to be recorded? Will it fit on the regular tag? That's a question that we've got to ask. Um, the tagging process itself. How much time does it take to apply each tag, and, and is it simple? If, if someone is only tagging a couple hundred assets, this isn't a real big deal, but if they're tagging thousands and thousands of assets and it takes five minutes to apply each tag, and there are some things that could go wrong in the attachment process, that's a huge deal. We're talking about a lot of labor cost, and if you're retrofitting a fleet of field assets with, with tags that must be attached with rear adhesive, for, for instance, just, just one example, there's a decent chance that you're going to have issues with the percentage of those. Um, a, the worker didn't clean off the surface well enough. B, they, 
applied the tag before the surface had dried from the, the, uh, the surface being cleaned. Uh, C, the fleet has assets with many different surface types, each which may require a specific kind of adhesive to guarantee a good adhesion. Uh, for big projects, tags that are quickly, quick to apply and are hard to apply incorrectly are very important. And in the end, uh, what are the expectations? And this, this seems like an obvious one, but to put the expectations down in simple terms is important. If someone expects the tags to outlast the asset, which is going to be subjected to 1,000 degree temperatures, and they can only justify a tag cost of 25 cents a piece, then you may have a problem. And, and you want a, this known early on rather than after everyone's put in a good amount of time. Of course, that's an extreme example, but, but you get the point. Um, the second step is the design process. And we listed a couple of examples here. But really what we're doing here is addressing all the items we uncovered in the dis discovery phase. So read range, well, we need to go with this particular transponder. High impact and abrasion, so it needs to be metal. Um, there's literally zero surface area to affix a tag, so we have to look at tethering the tag to the asset. Um, each challenge or requirement must be addressed by the tag design. One example of getting creative with the tag design, and you'll see this tag in the lower right, uh, the yellow plug tag. Uh, we had customers that they can't have a tag that actually protrudes or sticks off of the asset at all. And so literally the only way to RFID enable these assets is to drill a shallow recess and embed the tag subsurface. But this is a nightmare for large fleets. For one, they were going to have to try and pot each RF transponder into the drilled recess with two-part epoxy, which requires a dwell time for the epoxy to cure and it would just spill out the side anyway because it's impossible to balance the asset so the resin sits flat while it's curing. It, it's a mess. Um, the other issue is that for UHF RFID tags to read properly, or at least the, the kind that, that, that we're using, it has to be mounted perfectly flush with the bottom of the milled recess because the tag kind of uses the metal as an antenna. Good luck repeating a perfectly flat drilled pocket a few thousand times. That's just not going to happen. So what we ended up doing was perfectly affixing the RFID tag to a metal disc and encapsulating that metal disc into an HD plastic plug. And that was just glued and pressed into the pocket with Loctite. No mess, no dwell time, and repeatable tag performance because each tag was properly affixed to the metal disc in, uh, during the, the tag manufacturing process. And so this is just an example of some creative ways to get around some of those challenges that come up in the first step. The manufacturing process. So um, with oil and gas, you know, we, we do synthetics and, 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 and metal primarily. We found that in most uh, extreme oil and gas applications, you can't get away with anything short of metal or high density synthetics. And I'm talking synthetics that are too dense to injection mold. Um, Early on, we had customers that went cheap, and they got burned, and it, and it wasn't fun. The, the whole RFID system fails when the tags fail. So we really need to try to warn people about trying to save money by buying low-quality tags. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Holland is basically a big job shop. So we've got a lot of machines to make different kinds of tags with. But each machine has its own advantage and disadvantage to consider. Some machines are really cost-effective to run tag carriers on, but they only have the tonnage to make maybe like a two-by-one-inch tag or we could run a tag carrier across a laser so that there isn't any tooling cost or because the tag shape is kind of crazy, but the, the laser runs fairly slowly, so uh, it's more costly and, and than, than some of the other options. So these things need to be considered. And so complexity is a cost driver for your application if we can get away uh, with a more simple tag design for our most efficient machines, that's what we want to try to do. And, and these are the things that are really handled in the design phase. Um, and, what, and that's what we try to find out uh, at the beginning is the price point the customer is trying to hit early on in the process. So price is one of those things that can make a lot of decisions for us as far as what tag to offer and thus which machines we'll be using to, to make the tag or even the, the frequency, of, frequency of the tag that we embed. And finally, uh, and this is the, finally, there's the test process. And this is, really starts in the design phase. When we draw up a print of the tag construction, uh, we have to make sure that that tag design looks like a good fit for the challenges the tag will go through in the field. But quality testing is really important first at the, the prototype phase, then potentially a pilot before a full rollout. And even after the rollout, it's important to evaluate how the tags are doing in the field after a certain amount of time. 
Um, that's also a, a good time to see if there's uh, anything new on the market that might be an improvement. Technology is always rapidly improving, and rugged RFID is no exception. So that concludes the tag portion of the presentation. Um, the slide that you should be seeing right now has some links that you can visit to find out more about RFID and oil and gas at holland1916.com and at the Field ID site as well as RFID solution site. Um, and I know that Soman uh, and Field ID have some good ROI calculators as well you might uh, poke around at if you visit their site. So Kelly, uh, do you want to take it away for the Q&A section? Sure. We've got a couple questions in. Um, the first one then um, is RFID safe to use at drill sites? And Zach, I know you've had to deal with that before. I'm going to give that one to you. Yeah, absolutely, Kelly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, RFID is being used at the, the drill sites. And I, I imagine Dr. Zogi can, can uh, touch on this some as well. But while we haven't really done much with putting RFID tags into drill pipe, for instance, there are uh, uh, companies offering that solution out there, and it is being used. I think uh, at this point it's typically HF or LF, which are passive transponders. And the hardware has to meet certain requirements, I believe, as far as the readers go. Um, but it, it absolutely is used at the drill site. D Dr. Zogi, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, uh, you wrapped it up perfectly. Actually, low frequency is the one we have seen uh, that they embedded in the pipe. There has been some challenges in terms of structure integrity of the pipe. But there's a lot of activity going on. There, there's a local company here in Houston uh, that they have uh, actually implemented that. Uh, the challenge with the low frequency is a short distance for the read route. Uh, but there has also been some activity with ultra high frequency. So there are some, uh, but that's a challenge. That's a challenge by itself. So there is, there is not off the shelf solution at the present time. Okay, another question is, is there a standard in the oil and gas industry for RFID? So you might be the perfect one for that as well. Uh, the, the one that actually we have been using is OLF. Uh, it's a group out of Norway that we have been working with them. They have been actually working with standards for the past probably six, seven years. Uh, there are information on our website with respect to standard. Uh, they have volume of report. Anybody who's interested, they're more than welcome to go to the site and download it. And I think there is a tab that says standard uh, for RFID. There are other standard uh, committees that are active uh, in the oil and gas, but OLF is probably the primary <coughs> Uh, group, you know, working on a standard. Is, um, can your compliance system match several different pieces of equipment and standards? And Soman, that might be a good one for your answer. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, you know, that's where the, the software really comes in and you can definitely have different standards for different equipment. You can have different, um, we call them events. So you can have different events that go along with a specific piece of equipment. You can schedule different types of compliance events at specific times. So uh, the, you know, that's where RFID is just used as a point of identification, but the rest of it is taken care of by the system, and it, it really takes away all of the, the, the ambiguity. It, like you literally just scan a piece of equipment, and it, it does all the hard work for you, so it'll, it'll tell you what needs to be inspected and how to do that inspection and what standards apply to that piece of equipment. It manages that whole thing for you. Okay, and I got a follow-up to the, either that or uh, it says, what is the price range for RFID? I don't know if it's for the system or just the tag. I, I'm guessing that's a, a question more about the <laughs> tag. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, go ahead, Zach. Yeah, and I, I can I can 
field that one. And, and of course, there's no easy answer for that. It depends um, completely on the tag construction and the, the volume, uh, even the, the, the transponder that you embed. There are, there's a, a pretty big difference in cost between HF and UHF and UHF tags that have different read range. And so that's something that I can definitely deal um, if, if you, if you want to contact me, we can, we can discuss that. But I don't know, I, I, just as a rule of thumb for the, the tags that we're putting on above ground equipment in the field, um, we've, we've got tags that are 99 cents a piece. We have tags that are more like uh, 6 or $7 a piece. And uh, th those are all passive tags. So pretty wide range there, but it depends on a few factors. Uh, Zach, if I may add, since I'm not selling any tags, uh, this question comes up at every conferences we have had, and my my recommendation is uh, don't look at the value of a tag by itself, or even a reader, or just a solution. We have noticed in the oil and gas industry, the cost of the infrastructure to measure it supports RFID implementation is a lot more than the value for the reader and the tag. So whether the tag is five bucks or ten dollars. The, the, the problem is a lot more important, and the other thing is truly the infrastructure. In the middle of a desert, you don't have a power connection. I really don't care how much the value of a reader is, because there is no way you know to go ahead you know, and use it as a fixed reader. So there are many, many variables that if you are looking into implementation, I would highly recommend you guys look into it beyond the value of a tag or a reader. Right. Well, that's all the questions I see so far, but I really encourage everyone to uh, contact um, any one of these speakers, uh, download the white papers that are offered. We will have a recording of this webinar um, on the website tomorrow, and that will also have the recording of the slides. So. Um, Please check back in, and um, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, everyone. Everyone.